and thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Logistics with Purpose. I am here with my somewhat um, consistent now cohort in crime, Maureen Wolschlager. How are you, Maureen? Hi, Christy. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm excited. Um, this was a, guest, a, a company we've talked about, an organization we've talked about for a long time. And so uh, we've been fans of their work. I know you have specific interest in their work, which you'll talk a little bit more about later as well. But we're thrilled to have um, finally get this conversation set up and bring it to everyone out there. So I'll let you introduce our guest today. Uh, well, today we have David Burke, who is gray shirt and Chief Programs Officer at Team Rubicon. So welcome, David. Welcome. Thank you, Maureen. Thanks, Christy. Yeah, yes. we appreciate um, you getting up. This is earlier in the morning yes. where you are, and it's a Monday, so we appreciate you. Uh, Double duty. Making the and time for us. And with new kids. And with yes. new babies. Yes. And so it's two babies. Two You're babies at home. Yes. Um, so first of all, tell us, we want to hear, of course, we want to hear about what team, Ru team Rubicon is doing out in the world to make the better place. But first, we want to talk a little bit about you and hear a little bit about your story. So tell us where you grew up, about your childhood and sort of those early years of your life. Yeah, I grew up in Bettendorf, Iowa, in the Quad Cities right on the Mississippi River, um, and spent you know, my whole childhood in one community, we moved around a little bit, but stayed in the same general area and um, stayed in Iowa for college, went to the University of Iowa and finished a, a degree in marketing <clears throat> before joining the Marine Corps. Um, you know, I think about early years and, and kind of how it connects to, to what I do today. It was um, really seeing family uh, both grandparents served, a couple of my uncles served in the military, but my family's biggest kind of source of service was in, was in the church. I didn't have the, haven't had the same experience as I grew up, but, you know, found that influence of seeing my aunts and uncles and my parents serve in that way, um, really influenced kind of where I've gone in my professional career. Mm-hmm. Looking back, is there like a story or a particular experience from that time that you think has helped shape who you are or that you carry around with you and you think about often? Yeah, something I, I carry around a little bit, Maureen, is <clears throat> it's always a sad story, right? That kind of shapes, shapes who you are and teaches you a little bit about the rest of the world. But when I was in high school, I kind of stepped away from a lot of sports. I had a couple of a couple of sports I stayed active in, but wasn't constantly busy all, all year. And the counselor called me in his office one day, our guidance counselor at the school, and he said, Hey, I've got a I've got an opportunity for you. It's it's kind of work, but I think you might be the the person to to help this family. And the family was a, a single mother and a young boy who was autistic. And I spent every uh, every day after school that wasn't in season with with this young man and uh and his mom and saw how challenging life can be for some families and saw the difference in kind of lived experience that people have across the whole spectrum and it's it's stuck with me to just understand how that changes people's uh, ability to function day to day and what their you know, most important thing of the day is compared to a you know, family that may not have that challenge in the home or different means to deal with it or a different approach. So I think um, working with Jack when I was really young and getting to know his mom and their life was uh, something that just influenced my understanding of, of how people live day to day. Yeah. yeah. And just, yeah, like you said, living day to day differently, but just the sort of what you show up with on a daily basis to wherever community job, everything you're from, uh, everywhere that you go in your background, it sort of takes on a new, um, a new understanding and you never know what's going on behind the scenes with people. So that's a, a lovely way to see it up close and um, sounds like a really terrific uh, time of your life. Um, well, let's fast forward a little bit to your professional uh, journey. So as you mentioned, you have a bachelor's degree in marketing from the University of Iowa, and then you trained in crisis leadership at Harvard Kennedy School. Two very different paths, although 
in marketing myself, I can understand there are plenty of crises that come up. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about kind of those two experiences and, and what you learned at those times. Well, half of marketing is is managing crisis, right, Christy? Yes. yes. So um, super different timeframes in my life and very different experiences. But the, you know, I went to I went to undergrad thinking I was going to try to do something in the medical field and realized that me and organic chemistry was kind of a crisis. So chose to go a different path. And, and as I bounced around every different school or potential opportunity at University of Iowa, trying to figure out where I was going to go and what I was going to do, I kind of realized that there's an opportunity to do something more than, you know, get a degree, get a corporate job, sit at a desk or um, start a small business or a private practice. And um, had an opportunity while I was still young and able to do something that might require some physicality, but hopefully uh, offered an opportunity for leadership experience and management experience. And so I found the Marine Corps officer programs about halfway through college. <clears throat> and at that point, it was the the requirement for a Marine Corps officer program was to get a degree. So I just had to pick the discipline that was going to work for me. And I wanted to make sure it was applicable to a post-service, uh, post-service life if I didn't make a career out of it. And going through all these decisions when you're, you know, 20 years old is is really just a best guess. And as I uh, navigated my way into the Marine Corps, uh, became a logistics officer and served about five years. Um led people, uh, led mission, had a very close connection, understanding to the purpose of every day. And um, that kind of moved me down this path of leadership and management as a, as a career. Um, and I've tried a few different things along the way outside of service that didn't, didn't quite fit for me. I went into the corporate world with a big company that's ubiquitous for shipping things and having something to your door in two days and just really didn't enjoy the experience. I uh, did some consulting and I found my way to Team Rubicon. And that's actually when I um, saw some of the executive education programs at Harvard and looked at a course that was, it was only a week long course, but it had a huge impact and influence on the way I think about crisis and the way I think about emergency management and disaster relief. And so the the course there really kind of shaped a little bit of how Team Rubicon has been built and and what we do and how we look at the space of coordination post disaster. And what was what was one of those lessons, if you can share with us? I think the biggest one, and you know, it's coming from a, a Big Ten school in the Midwest. You don't you almost want to not like the the Harvard class, right? You're kind of like, ah, it can't be that good, but it, it was it was actually that good. And uh, yeah, like it's the, all plea, it's all you know, khakis and ties. The, it's, it's different. Yeah. There's no football here, right? Yeah. <laughs> but there were two two great professors. It'll it'll drive me nuts. I can't remember the two names, and it was only a week. But <clears throat> the biggest piece that that helped me understand after a few years of working in disaster and listening to these folks that have been studying crisis ac- academically, the idea of emergence theory. And that the connections that need to be made in the immediate hours and days after a crisis or at the start of a crisis will happen. Mm -hmm. And you can try to circumvent it. You can try to do everything possible before a crisis happens. And you should. It's, It's worthwhile investment. But every single one, you'll see a different network evolve and emerge from whatever challenge is facing a population. And and to some degree, you have to put in prep work to understand that that will happen as much as you do to try to circumvent it from happening before the disaster. So the, the flexibility to, to work in that early hours and days ambiguity is critically important to, to the work that we do. And, and just having someone in a position of, you know, kind of academic authority be able to frame it in a way that was relatively easy to understand really helped me think through what the opportunity space is Um, and again it doesn't stop folks from investing before disasters and before crisis but if you don't 
allow the flexibility for things to happen after after the fact, then you kind of fight against reality in some ways. Oh, that is a great lesson. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it, we should definitely mention, you know, less than 1% of the United States population like serves in the, in the active duty military. So for you to kind of go and take that route is in itself a little bit unique, right? So you were studying undergrad at the University of Iowa, and then you transitioned into the Marine Corps. Um, and I guess I have like two questions about this, but one was like, how did you feel that transition when, and did you feel prepared for kind of the experiences that you were going to have there? But then kind of after you just spoke about the, the leadership crisis um, class at, at Harvard, do you feel like your experience in the Marine Corps helped you prepare more than maybe some of your peers in that program because you've already kind of lived some of that in a in an environment that had a lot of resources you know um, whereas most disasters don't always have that when uh, people are responding um yeah two parts so the first part did did uh you know typical high school college prepare me for the marine corps um I think yes and no. I don't think there's anything that really prepares a 22 year old to take a commission in the military. Maybe maybe the academies are totally different. But I went through the the Marine Corps calls it platoon leaders course two summers during college. I went to six weeks of officer boot camp, uh, officer candidate school, and I think that generally kind of prepared you for the environment expectation. But it's a uh, I think it's an entirely individual reaction and experience to stand in front of Marines for the first time, not in a training environment <clears throat> where they expect you to lead a team, a department, an organization, and um, set the right example, make the right decisions, you know, push on the right things, and take the right advice from your from your senior enlisted leaders. I think that's uh, almost has to be a, a lived experience to. To understand what what it really looks like, you can read about it all day, but until you have that responsibility levied on you, <clears throat> and individual Marines looking you in the eye saying, "What do we do now, sir?" I think that's uh, something you just have to experience to understand. I would um, say that most of this vulnerable doesn't really understand that when you start as a young officer in any of the services that at 21, 22, whenever you graduate college, like you are in charge of making some of these decisions that if you were to go into a corporate environment, you wouldn't necessarily start off with that sort of level of accountability, responsibility, decision-making authority. So it's a huge responsibility and task that I don't know that there's a lot of ways to compare it to let's say the other 99 percent that don't see it especially if you're in a combat or a crisis situation the stakes are a lot higher and um i think that you know they really do train you or try to at least you know be a good leader and make good decisions but like you said you get out there it's different there's the theory and then there's the actual you get thrown in right away so Thrown in, thrown straight into the deep end. I think there's <laughs> there are officers that that sink and officers that swim. the The system and structure of the military is designed around you know an officer that has that responsibility and a senior enlisted leader that advises and helps grow those officers and nudges behind and says this is the right decision, make this one. Mm -hmm. And I had I was incredibly fortunate. I had a E9, extremely senior enlisted leader that I got the privilege of working with very early and learn more from, from him and his leadership in how to be a good officer. And he set me up for success in the very early days of my experience there. And that, that's what makes or breaks, I think, Marine Corps officers or military officers in general is that opportunity to really learn from somebody that's been in for 10, 15 or in this case, uh, the master gunner sergeant had been in for 26 years. Yeah, as I was say, if you're 22 and experience. you're working with an E9, um, he has a ton of experience 22. to share with you. You know, and so he he definitely made made me successful. There's a lot of great great master guns, Davidson stories, but um, <laughs> that that made or break um, my military experience. 
and what I was able to take from it and learn from other other staff NCOs and and NCOs along the way. But it really did that. I was a logistics officer. Crisis work is a logistics challenge. The right people, the right things at the right time. Too early is just as bad as too late. And <clears throat> learning to work in that environment um, to draw down operations. We helped draw down uh, combat operations in Iraq, move in equipment sets and battalions back home, closing battle space, handing it off. And in Afghanistan, very similar. The the When I was there in 2011, 2012, there was a strict limit on boots on the ground. So the number of people that were allowed to be inside of Afghanistan was briefed to the, the Secretary of Defense every single day. And we had Marines that were on such a tight timeline that the Marine leaving had to fly home before the Marine replacement could fly in. And so just managing the, the logistics, the people logistics of not breaking the bog limit, as it was called, but still not letting any mission fail was a super interesting space to work in. And it was, again, during drawdown and transition. So you're, you're losing kind of the, the, the combat power, the, the hard target presence, because you have to trade off who's where and what are they doing while you're handing off battle space. Well, there's not as much continuity, right? If people don't have that, they don't that have overlap. A yeah. Yeah. I mean, turnover is natural there anyway, but when you, when there's like, no, they can't even high five in the same, <laughs> unless it's an airspace, you know, it does right. make, you're almost having to take a step back every time you're taking a step forward, I'm sure. And so I think that experience really lent itself to, to what we do at Team Rubicon and, and how we've built the organization to, to manage in tough environments. Yeah, for sure. Well, speaking of Team Rubicon, so you transitioned out of the military, found Team Rubicon. Um, so our U.S. listeners may be very familiar, but for the rest of our audience and those who are not familiar, please explain um, both the mission of Team Rubicon and your role as well. Yeah, so Team Rubicon is a veteran-led humanitarian organization that serves global communities before, during, after crises. Um, so that, you know, that's a typical mission statement, get everything in there. But um, we've, we really started as a veteran-based organization and had a predominantly veteran volunteer base. Over the years, that's expanded. We've got a ton of veteran leadership, but we have as many civilian volunteers and staff members as we do veterans. So the organization's broadened that veteran leadership in a humanitarian organization. We've realized over the years, every action the organization's taken has been a humanitarian action. Sometimes we focus on disasters. The domestic context may not lend itself to the word humanitarian, but helping someone on a bad day is always a, a humanitarian action. So we've been in operations for 13 years, worked in 1,100 different disasters or crises across the country, around the world. And the premise of the organization is that military veteran has great experience that applies to the disaster relief context. And that military culture and ethos is attractive to a much broader base than just our veterans. So that culture and ethos of, of you know, bias for action, cutting through as much red tape as we can, but doing it with good risk mitigation skills and good safety awareness has let the organization grow to about 160,000 volunteers across the country that work both domestically and overseas. And the mission has grown to mitigation response and recovery work tied to disasters. So we help mitigate fires before they happen at individual properties and for community uh, assets and infrastructure. We respond and help homeowners directly with things like getting all the flood laden water and debris out of a home so they can start the rebuild process. And then we do work in some communities to rebuild homes and get families back into a stable, hygienic, more resilient home than pre-storm. So hopefully it can weather the next one better. And overseas, we do medical and water work to make sure that folks can stabilize immediately post-disaster or human-caused crisis. Um, and I've been with the organization for just over 10 years, uh, and I'm the chief programs officer, so I help work with teams across all of that programming to design and train for and build capacity to execute it. Um, and it's been a, a hell of a 
10 year ride helping build the organization. For sure. Well, you shared some of the um, statistics, which is incredible in of itself. Do you have uh, one or two stories, success stories that you can share either um, from your time personally um, out there uh, giving back or ones that are really popular within the organization itself or that you love? Yeah, we're, we're, we're never uh, shy from capturing inflection points or points of change. I think the one that that still sticks with me is Hurricane Harvey, uh, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Maria, the, the 2017 hurricane season that was, yeah. you know, just devastating across from Corpus Christi to Puerto Rico. Everything in between was impacted to some degree by one of those three hurricanes. And it was a, an inflection point for the organization because when Harvey hit, much like the rest of the emergency management space, disaster uh, philanthropy space, and the nonprofit space, everybody went. Everybody ran headfirst into Harvey, thinking, you know, most years you get a couple of major landfalls and they're spread far enough apart that you can kind of get some work done, reconstitute, and be ready for the next one. Irma and Maria were so close behind Hurricane Harvey that the ability to flex any resources to those two was stressful across the whole system. But we did <clears throat> 2000 gray shirts of our volunteers. We call it gray shirts. It's our, it's our uniform. It's a ode to the military culture and ethos, but um, every gray shirt is a gray shirt first and then has a role in the organization that they, that they play. But we sent nearly 2000 to the Harvey affected area. And that was, from you know the Texas Louisiana border all the way down to Corpus Rockport Texas and huge huge amount of work across I think a total of eight different operating areas there and then we were able to to have the capacity to get three uh, operating areas in the Irma affected area in Florida and then um, an additional team to work in Puerto Rico and then in the aftermath that really launched the organization's long-term recovery and rebuild programming. So we still have teams rebuilding homes that were affected by Hurricane Harvey in the Houston and greater Houston area. We built over 40 homes in Florida after Hurricane Irma and we put 500 families back under hurricane resilient roofs in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. And this last year after Hurricane Fiona, Took a similar path into Puerto Rico that Irma did. We found three of those roofs that had been leaking and went back and helped those families get those repaired. But three out of 500 after five years and multiple yeah. storms, we thought was was pretty good. So that's that's probably one that sticks with me more than uh, more than some. But there's a, a hundred experiences on small scale events that are so so. Um, similar for the family but so different for the community and the country at large you don't you don't hear about the floods that are happening in chinle arizona on the navajo nation you don't hear about small tornadoes in the midwest that only a few families are affected by that family's experience is no different than the thousands or millions of people that were affected by these big storms so the ability to get gray shirts to these small communities is is just as impactful, uh, but doesn't necessarily connect or stress the organization the way these big events do. What is that? Um, just, I guess on two fronts, what is that decision making process like? Both from, as you said, there are sometimes when only a, a few people are affected that may not make the headlines as some of these others do. So. How is it decided, yes, we're going to step into that space as well? And then kind of the same thing on the rebuilding front. I don't think the rebuild, rebuilding front happens at every location as well. So what is the decision-making process there? Should we stay or should we go? So there, yeah, there's a couple of parts. We always say uh, a disaster happens when a local community is overwhelmed. That can happen at the household level. You just, your family, or it can happen on the block, or it can happen in a big city like Houston. But if the if we identify a community that's been overwhelmed and we identify a vulnerable population, it could be again one family, it could be a whole census tract, or it could be a whole county. Uh, but if we identify a community that's been overwhelmed, 
a vulnerability that warrants the work and we have the resources to do it. That's kind of the kind of the decision process. So we always look at social vulnerability index as a great guide tool to see where the community is going to need the most help and overlay that with where it was impacted by a disaster. So the two of those start to guide the resources and then you show up and sometimes you show up and there are 10 organizations already there. And that is usually an indicator for us that we should look a little harder and see if somebody's not getting help because it didn't make the news cycle or it was slightly lower on the vulnerability index or some other variable that got missed because the, again, back to the emergence theory, if you see one community on the news that was impacted, that's the easy starting point for all organizations to go. You're going to find somebody that needs help. But if you don't zoom out again and look and say, well, there's a ton of resources here, where it might be missing? So we try to find the communities that need the most help. And when resources are rich, we try to reorient and not overwhelm a community with additional support. Um, and then on the rebuild side, it's very, very similar. One of the things that we're working really hard to do is, is get some of our philanthropic partners to understand that low attention disasters affect families the same way as a massive hurricane or a big tornado or a big flood. So we're working with some of our philanthropic partners to make funding available to rebuild in communities that never make the news cycle and find some of those families that <clears throat> need the same amount of help, but the resourcing is never there. In those cases, we work with closely with local leadership that could be faith-based leadership. It could be a community-based organization could be the emergency management department. Some cities are, are incredible about how much they know about their community. Some, some communities don't have as much insider information, but uh, identifying the folks that are most vulnerable and making the investment in those families the same way we are able to after a major hurricane is something that we'll continue to kind of fight at. The disaster relief space is inequitable and attention drives some of that inequity. And when, you know, big corporations, big organizations want to give because they saw it on the news, it creates a resourcing environment that's so different than the resource for a small community. And then our federal and state and local system doesn't have the capacity to close those gaps. The federal declarations happen less often compared to the volume of increase or the frequency increase in disasters. So there's a, a widening gap in resourcing for the disaster relief space that the nonprofit sector is being asked to, to come into and, and help more. Um, I think I just rambled a ton, Christy. I'd no, you didn't. No. no, it's really interesting. <laughs> no, we, let, we, we could eat this up all day. Yeah. This is great info because like we're, we're here, we're talking about like logistics with purpose. And I don't know if we could find another organization that really embodies this, you know, in the way that, that you guys do, you know, and, you know, to follow on some of the topics we've touched upon so far, but, you know, a lot of the skills and experiences you or anyone in the military has are, you know, unique and different from those that you get in civilian training. And do you feel like there's any skills or experiences that you had during your time in the Marine Corps that's really helped uh, you kind of lead your team in the disaster initiatives, you know, that Team Rubicon takes on? You know, every day. I think we talked about it at the start, Marine, when when we said the exposure and experience you get in the military is just not impossible, but near impossible to match in the civilian sector at, at 22 or 25 or 30, mm -hmm. for that matter. Um, and I think those those early experiences, the weight of the responsibility, the expectation to take every situation seriously, understand the risks that you're gonna, you know, walk into or put Marines make, you know, make Marines exposed to and and really think through that mission planning. It's directly applicable post disaster, whether you're in a domestic context or an international context. It's it's things like the water supply being, you know, unpotable. You can't you can't rely on, you know, showers, water, flushing toilets, simple simple things like that that you kind of know as a planning factor, if you've been anywhere in the military, 
it might take a, a minute or two to digest and plan against and mitigate for those basic infrastructure gaps that you'll see post-disaster that a military planner is just used to. And then all the other risks that are associated, and it's everything from from the personal physical risks that people accept to the environmental risks of, you know, floods do bad things to water sources and chemical sites. And when you work in areas like Houston, it's largely driven by petrochemicals and has a bunch of different, you know, risk profiles that you don't think about other places. We have to be super careful where where we send people and what we're asking them to do to make sure we're taking care of our duty of care to the volunteer base um, and do the right thing. So I think there's a ton of different experiences you get in the military in kind of rapid succession and you get re repeat experience that helps people just think about things a little bit differently uh, when they are approaching these these types of environments that we work in. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned um sort of just now the personal responsibility liability risks uh to your team and volunteers as well as responding to three hurricanes at once during one season um i'm curious what have been some of your biggest lessons learned when responding to disasters either internationally or domestically and that could be either just some that have been your own or maybe some in leading a team um but what were some of those uh big challenges that you consider you know that you've considered beyond that that you've taken into account how you do things differently going forward yeah there's <clears throat> plenty of plenty of different points out early early days for Team Rubicon, we used to stand up in front of a group and say, here's, here's the task for the day. Who knows how to run heavy equipment? Mm -hmm. And you're standing in front of a you know, group of 25 or 30 or 40 um, half military veterans, half type A, ready to help people, civilians, and every hand goes up. <laughs> you know, the likelihood that every single one of you is run a bulldozer is pretty low. <laughs> and so early on, we don't the, have time to do a competency test. So yeah. how are we going to whittle it down to two, right? How do we whittle it down to two or three? So yeah. we learned early on as the organization grew that the one of the keys to scale was going to be standardization and consistency. And we had to invest in training pipelines, competency testing before disasters to make sure that we didn't make it a bigger disaster in some ways, right? If you leave a a skid steer or an excavator broken down next to a house because you slammed into the slab too hard and broke all the hydraulic lines. That, you know, that doesn't help the community recover. Now you've become another thing that has to be dealt with, repaired. Um, and so standardization and consistency became really, really clear. Early on, we could do a lot of small team, a lot of really, really um flexible, fast operations as the organization's grown and, and found the space that we're most active in most consistently, the training pipelines and standardization have been critical for, for our ability to help more communities at the same time. So that that's probably one of the, the biggest lessons. And I think it's a constant for organizations that continue to grow. Uh, we've done work over the last four years that have been has been well outside of our normal core operating and some of it was driven by the pandemic and some of it was driven by the rapid withdrawal from Afghanistan and, and a doubling of the total inbound refugees for the year. And so over the last 18 months, the refugee resettlement system has been double its normal standing capacity to get Afghan allies back into the country. And so being able to flex into that space in a consistent and standardized way because we thought about it with the existing organizations that do the work and then flex out when the capacity goes back down has been a, a another lesson that we've learned in that we will get asked to do anything when there's a gap in the community and we try to say yes if we think we can do it but make sure we know what we're going to do and know a little bit of what the exit plan looks like if it's not a permanent line of operations for the organization so i think those two building standards for the work we do all the time and knowing what the approach is to exit uh, for work that we're going to do temporarily. Those are two of the probably biggest kind of guiding organizations that's allowed us to stay flexible, but grow um, at the pace that we have. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I mean, you guys have over 160,000 volunteers in the U.S. And so, you know, you mentioned some of them are military, some are first responders, you know, many aren't. You know, how do you re recruit them? I mean, you talked a little bit about training, but how do you recruit them and how do you continue to kind of expand that network? Do you utilize the military connections that are a different avenue or mm -hmm. um, and especially be, I think our listeners will definitely be interested in, you know, how could they become a volunteer? I know I am. <laughs> team team rubric on USA.org slash volunteer. Um, <clears throat> it's super easy to sign up. The the military connections and the military and veteran organizations have been huge recruiting sources and consistency drivers for kind of the total volunteer base. The very early days, it was it was very peer to peer driven, network driven, social media driven. Um, I think in more recent years, maybe we'll go from Hurricane Harvey forward. It's been largely event driven. So big events happen, and we we get a bunch of. Uh, earned media, media hits from different outlets, folks find the organization, Google it, and then start the process to sign up. Um, and those events, the usually large disasters, have driven big spikes in new volunteers, uh, and that's kept the volunteer base growing. And I think what's important about the size of the volunteer base, it's not that it's necessarily the number, it's that's what's necessary because volunteerism has to fit in life. Right. Everybody's at a different phase of life. My volunteer time right now is a little low with two girls under two at home. So that that affects my kind of ebb and flow with how I, you know, participate with organizations outside of my, um, you know, my work commitments. The, the extra time is is tighter than uh, maybe five years ago when. I didn't have any children and I had a ton more flexibility in my day-to-day -day schedule. So life has to line up with volunteers. And so of that 160,000, we don't have an expectation that people show up X number of days per year or month or week. We have a lot of folks that have crazy flexibility and show up for hours every week or weeks every year. And then we have folks that show up once every one, two or five years because it fits in their life. And that's that's equally valuable to make sure that capacity smooths out over time. So the big numbers matter because um, that's kind of the potential energy of the volunteer base and it can't all be kinetic at once. And that's not the, the need. So um, I'm probably rambling again, Marie. No, it's good stuff. Yeah. yeah. So can you talk a little bit about like what your volunteers take away from these experiences? Yeah, we, we've been tracking both our clients, the folks that we're delivering services to and our volunteer base for many years now. And our volunteer base, we, we always had this theory that there are three things that are stronger in uniform than out of uniform. In uniform, your community, purpose, and identity are very, very high. You have a unit, small, Small team, you know, your platoon, your company, your battalion, your service, and you have all those different levels of community that you can attach to. And then your purpose is clear. It's clear in every role in the military, how you're contributing to the overall military objective. And then your identity, you, know, you, you put a uniform on every day. It's got your name on it somewhere. If you're in dress uniform, it's got things that you've done and been awarded for and been recognized for. If you it's like your have, you wear your resume every day. You wear your resume every day. You do. It's, it's a <laughs> yeah. way to to have a really strong sense of identity. In the transition space, it's it's often harder to find that. It's hard to find a a career that's similar to military service. That community purpose and identity, one of them, two of them, maybe all three of them have a dip in that transition. So what we've found is we've as we've surveyed and studied and asked the questions to the volunteer base is those three things um, stay higher when they engage with Team Rubicon. And that's volunteers, um, veterans, civilian, emergency medical provider, former law enforcement, um, former firefighter, they all, they all report an increase in community purpose identity 
through their affiliation with the organization and how they activate. And that's, that's kind of the, what we, what we seek to close a gap in for the volunteer base is, is that, and it's not specific to military veterans. It's, I think it's universal. If you are serving someone else, if you're doing something bigger than yourself in your day to day, that connection to purpose is almost impossible to miss. And I think it's, uh, again, I, I talked about my family a little bit and their connection, the purpose was through faith. It's just a different type of faith, uh, something you can believe in and, and feel connected to and helping somebody when it's really clear that they need help. And it's clear that you can do some small act of kindness that makes a big difference in their life. That that creates a connection to purpose and the hopefully the gray shirt creates a little bit of an identity and the community on, on operations is pretty cool. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, and of course, we can't let you go without uh, getting to know a little bit more about you have a Roku TV series for Team Rubicon. That's incredibly exciting. Maureen and I were thrilled when we discovered that. So um, tell us more what it is about and how um, what people can expect when they're watching. Yeah, so the Roku series is a cool development over the last year. It all happened really, really fast. Um, but the the team from this old house actually did a, a small cameo with some of our rebuild work years ago. And I think that idea percolated in that in that team's head and the Roku channel took on this uh, 13 part docu series. And so you'll see Kevin, the host from this old house. And the first episode is really the, the backstory, the history of the organization and, and Kevin's first deployment. And over the course of the series, you see almost all aspects of the organization. It's heavily focused on the domestic work, but you get little, little snippets of some of the international and rebuild work and our Clay Hunt Fellows program, and you get to see just a little bit of everything Team Rubicon does and Kevin's journey to become a part of the gray shirt community. And he, and he really does. He goes through training classes. He goes to multiple operations. He does the work that any gray shirt does when they show up. He doesn't you know, stand around and TV host or commentate. He's just part of the organization as it happens. And it's a... Uh, it's a great way to see what it's like to be a, a volunteer with Team Rubicon. And it's something that uh, we're pretty proud of and excited to, excited to have people watching. It's on the Roku channel. It uh, can be streamed for free. It's a you know, cool, cool way to see into the organization. Yes. Uh, and I have a feeling that 160,000 number, volunteer number is going to go up it's very soon. It's going to go up a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Get, your, get your website ready so you don't have like a Taylor right. Swift uh Breaking yeah. the internet there. Yeah, the, yeah. The launch was over Memorial Day, and we had like we had like a standing technology operations center to make sure the website was good. The brand and communications team were on call. It was a, it was like running a, an operation, but wow. just specifically to make sure the infrastructure was there if the interest yes. spiked. And we did. We saw pretty cool increases in the daily website traffic, and it was a neat neat thing to see. That's, That's awesome. wonderful news. Great to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't want to let you go without finding out how can our listeners connect with you? How can they connect with Team Rubicon? And how do they support Team Rubicon? So we want to make sure we get the word out. But yeah. So the, the website's teamrubiconusa.org. That's where you can volunteer. It's where you can share stories. It's where you can donate if you have the means to support the organization financially. And uh, kind of all three jump off of that that landing point, and we always always looking for new volunteers, new ways to share the story, new spins on and interests in the organization, and then obviously there's a million things more important than money. They all cost money, so you got to support financially as well. But the the website's the best jumping off point, and it connects to all the other digital properties and the Roku series and everything else. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for your time. This has been wonderful. It was worth the wait for Maureen and I who yeah. can really just schedule this for a long time. So thank you so much. I know, uh, even, you know, a couple of times you were like, am I rambling? And I'm like, no, not at all, because I just imagine the other humanitarian organizations listening. And I think there's so much they can glean from your insight on what's worked, what doesn't, what your process is. And I think that's one of the 
beneficial things of having conversations like this with organizations like yours is we can all learn from each other in, in a variety of ways. So thank you so much for your time. Um, everyone go check out the website and of course watch the, the docu-series on Roku like Maureen and I will be doing. Um, thanks for listening. Subscribe if you want to hear more terrific conversations like this. And David, keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.